the Florida man has contracted a very rare and potentially deadly form of anthrax. September 18th, 2001, just one week after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. In Boca Raton, Florida today, a memorial service for Bob Stevens. He is almost certainly the first American to be killed in a deliberate anthrax attack. Letters containing the deadly bacteria anthrax arrived at the headquarters of several media outlets. A member of my personal staff who has contracted a cutaneous anthrax infection. Other letters arrived at the offices of Democratic Senators Patrick Leahy and Tom Daschle. And 29 staffers for Senator Tom Daschle's office have tested positive for exposure to anthrax. The FBI says the heart of its case is... This the act of domestic bioterrorism spurred a number of new initiatives to improve the U.S. readiness against biological attacks. But it will be several more days before the government discloses its entire case. In the years since, government intelligence officials have frequently consulted with scientists about naturally occurring microbes that could be weaponized and those that could be engineered in a lab. I regularly have visits from leadership in our federal government, uh, including leadership from the FBI and the CIA, and invariably the discussion turns to concerns about engineered microbes and could they be used for untoward purposes. And my answer always is yes, but then I tell them that's not my concern. My concern is what nature has in store for us. And the phrase that I used, which unfortunately is uh, quite apropos, is that the next pandemic is coming. I don't know when, I don't know from where, but it's coming and we are woefully ill-prepared. Where the anthrax attacks killed five people and sickened 17, the novel coronavirus, as of mid-April 2020, has killed more than 40,000 Americans and sickened nearly a million others. I'm Rob Piercy. I'm Rachel Tampa. And today we're talking with Allen Distinguished Investigator James Collins from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Wies Institute. Collins and his colleagues are working on an idea that could be transformative in the fight against coronavirus. More on that in a moment. But first, a bit more about Collins and his lab. Their specialty is systems biology how parts of living systems work together, the big picture. They also specialize in synthetic biology. You could think of this like biology meets engineering, where scientists design new systems that don't exist in the natural world, or they take pieces from the real world and use them to make new engineered systems. Like tens of thousands of scientists around the globe, much of their work has moved from the lab to home. The last 30 days have been a whirlwind. I mean, it's been tr truly dramatic. Uh, you know, MIT got out ahead of other Northeast schools, if not in the country. You know, the Institute announced, it must have been probably the week of March 10th, that we were going to be sending kids home. My daughter's a student at MIT, and she was heading out to the NSA championships. The day the team was heading out, MIT informed them that they were canceling their trip. Um, within a couple of days, the university then moved up the expectation when the students needed to be moved out. So we rapidly got my daughter home. My son, who's a senior in high school, his school got canceled or shifted to uh, being at home. Then MIT started shutting down labs and, and really moving to remote as much as possible, as did the Broad and as did the Beast Institute, where I have my labs spread out. It's always heartbreaking to shut down operations for whatever reason and that we want to keep things being advanced. And we probably have about a third to a half of folks still in some capacity at the lab, but now all focused on COVID-19. While Collins is running his lab from home during this pandemic, his wife is in the thick of the medical response. So my wife's a primary care physician at Mass General. So she's at Mass General right now treating patients. And has been on the front lines testing and caring for the patients. And here in Massachusetts, we're worried about the surge, um, uh, which has yet to come, thankfully. And the numbers are increasing by the day, but we've yet to see the spike that you all saw, and we've yet to see the spike that New York has seen. 
What if there was a way to predict a pending spike in COVID-19 patients in real time? It turns out Collins and his colleagues have been working on an idea that could do just that. This notion uh, rose within our group just about two, three weeks ago, and it builds in our work in synthetic biology. We're going back now about six years ago, uh, work pioneered by Keith Pardee, who was a postdoc in my lab. We got intrigued about playing in cell-free synthetic biology. Cell-free synthetic biology. All right, what's that now? So do you remember how we talked about using parts of biological machinery to make an engineered system? Okay, right. The idea here is you can open up a living cell and take out some of its components. So things like DNA, RNA, ribosomes, etc. Exactly. And they call all of this cell-free extracts. These extracts are what laboratories use to find the presence of viruses and other microbes. And what Collins and his colleagues have been working on since well before coronavirus are paper-based diagnostics. So these extracts are embedded onto a piece of paper that acts as both the lab and the test tube. You can apply a drop of, say, saliva or blood to the paper, and it changes color in response to the presence of a particular virus or microbe. And we got excited and used this to actually launch a uh, new class of inexpensive diagnostics that were paper-based diagnostics. And we did this initially for Ebola in the midst of the Ebola outbreak and subsequently did it for Zika uh, in the Zika outbreak. Going back about a year ago, we also got motivated to see if we could extend this platform from paper to other substrates and demonstrated that it wasn't limited to paper, that it could work on other poor substrates, including cloth, and use this to design wearable synthetic biology. So these would be uh, diagnostics that could be integrated into jackets, a, a lab coat for a doctor, or a protective gear for first responders and military personnel. In the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, Jim and his team recognized that such a diagnostic could be built into a face mask. Where you could have a protective face mask for a healthcare worker or for a patient or for somebody just at home. And the system would be designed so that you would have integrated into the face mask the self reactracts along with sensors for COVID-19. The reason this mask could work is the same reason that the Centers for Disease Control has recommended people wear masks when they go out of the house. You know, as we speak, we give off a good amount of vapor. And if you're infected, you actually also give off viral particles, both in your, in your cough and your sneezing, but also uh, when speaking in small droplets and in vapor. And our notion is that if you wear the mask, then within two to three hours, you could have a readout as to whether you're infected by, for example, having the mask design to give off a colorimetric output in the case of a positive test. Okay, Rob, you remember hypercolor shirts from the early 90s? Or what about mood rings? Oh, uh, yeah, I had mood rings when I was a little kid. And then when I was older, I had a hypercolor shirt. All the cool kids had hypercolor shirts, right? <laughs> I didn't have a hypercolor shirt, so I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> um, but anyway, the way these shirts and rings work is that they have what's called a colorimetric output. So they have these built-in, you know, low-tech sensors and they change color in response to a change in temperature in your body. So that's kind of what these masks would do. There are sensors that are built into them that cause the mask to change color in the presence of coronavirus. The mask itself would have some level of protection depending on its grade and also help prevent passing on if the person is infected. They would wear it for some period of time. It's you know, not clear yet how long would they need to wear it because we're not sure of the viral load that's given off from everyday talking, breathing, coughing, and sneezing. But then after some period of time, you'd envision they could take it off or check to see, has it changed color? Say after a two hour, maybe three hour period. Uh, if it hasn't, you could take with some confidence that you're at least at present not infected. If it has changed color, I think you then immediately contact your physician, as well as to immediately begin to self-isolate and self-quarantine. a wearable canary in the coal mine during an outbreak of a respiratory virus where many people are spreading it before they ever have symptoms. This could go a long way in helping curb the spread 
and provide important data to researchers. What we need for any given outbreak are data, and data on, on who's been exposed, who is infected, so that you can take the measures to isolate those individuals and do contact tracing to identify those who were exposed, to then isolate them appropriately to try to break the spread. You know, why I think this virus is so insidious, probably the number one reason is that you can be infectious several days before you're symptomatic. And now even newer data are indicating that you can be infectious and never become symptomatic. If you're infectious, then you're giving off viral particles. And I, I suspect that in coming weeks, we'll see more and more that one of the key ways this virus is transmitted is actually through being nearby to somebody, whether you're talking, sneezing, or coughing. And so again, you can envision that if it was suspected that the U.S. was seeded with a number of infected individuals, if you had something such as an inexpensive mask, you could envision having wide distribution and now pick up folks who are at the early stages of infection who may be yet to be symptomatic by having them wear the mask and now suddenly, oh goodness, I'm infected. I better not go visit my grandmother or my grandfather or I better stay home, self-isolate for two weeks or maybe longer to now break the chain of infection that really has now led to this thing spreading across the entire United States. Is it too late for a mask like this to make a difference in this pandemic? As some epidemiologists have suggested, mitigation measures like social distancing, contact tracing, and masks could go on for many months until there is a proven vaccine. And Colin says he and his colleagues are moving quickly to bring the mask to reality. We are making very impressive progress and have over the last two weeks or so. We are hopeful to have proof of concept demonstrations within the next 10 days to two weeks. At that stage, it's kind of how do you go from what might be kind of a, a crappy first draft of a face mask device to now something that's a legitimate prototype. So I'm, I'm expecting positive data in about two weeks. I think you're then looking out a few weeks from that to get into a possible design. And you know, our, we were, I was on a design call this morning and we're targeting to get these out in this summer so they could be used as part of this pandemic and part of the way we can ease this current crisis. Before the coronavirus pandemic, there was the 1918 flu pandemic. Before that, multiple cholera pandemics. Before that, the bubonic plague. If history has taught us anything. Uh, the next pandemic is coming. Uh, I don't know when, I don't know from where, but it's coming. It's almost for sure gonna jump from animal into humans. It's almost for sure gonna be a virus and unfortunately likely to be a respiratory virus. Uh, the hopeful comment to share is I do think our leaders have now woken to the need to be ready. I think the scientific community is being activated to be ready. So I am confident that we will be much better prepared for the next pandemic as a result of our experience with COVID-19. For more stories, videos, and science news, head over to our website, alleninstitute.org. I'm Rachel Tompa. And I'm Rob Piercy. Thanks for listening.